Hello, my name is Alberto Marquez. In this video, we will discuss the appendices C and D of the Port Planning and Investment Toolkit. Appendix C, estimating throughput capacity example. The models used to estimate port throughput capacity are either linear static models using spreadsheets or more sophisticated dynamic simulation models that can show the impact of system dynamism and random events. Static models support equation-based analysis to estimate throughput capacity and equipment requirements as a function of the site layout, physical characteristics, and current anticipated operating practices. Spreadsheet models can also be used to examine isolated facility functions or specific demand versus capacity issues. A dynamic simulation model can be developed to gain a better understanding of the complexity and integrated multimodal aspects of the entire port operation. These models should take into account many operational variables and random variations to analyze specific project alternatives. Although some project challenges require the use of simulation models, static models often provide results sufficient to readily examine a broad range of factors that influence port capacity. Regardless of the various spreadsheet and simulation models that are available or can be used for port projects, capacity models should support basic computations and have a structure that allows for increasing level of details as planning process progresses and that are transparent in their assumption and algorithms. The throughput capacity of a facility is a function of the physical assets of the facility and the rate at which those assets are used. Physical assets can be identified from drawings and other resource descriptions. The rate of asset use generally has two components, physical space and time. With regard to physical space, the analysis must recognize that in addition to physical space actually in use, the facility operators must reserve empty space that maintains fluidity and allows the facility to operate at adequate productivity. Operators more also allocate sufficient space to sustain accessibility to objects that must be handled or processed. With regard to time, the analysis must recognize that demand is uneven over time and that physical space must be reserved to allow efficient service of peak conditions. For example, in the context of freight terminal, analysis of the bird must allow for the physical lengths of vessels as well as the gaps between vessels required for mooring and maneuvering. The bird analysis must also reflect the need to have birds available when vessels arrive, even if the schedule reliability is low. The bird analysis also needs to reflect seasonal variations in call durations caused by changes in vessel exchange rates. With this example, it can be seen that there is a physical length plus access space plus reserve space as well as physical call duration plus viability reserve plus peaking reserve. This appendix include an example of a robust approach and tools that can be prepared using static model to estimate bird and storage GR capacity in a container terminal. Similar approaches can be used for auto railroad, dry liquid bulk, brake bulk, and passenger terminals. Bird capacity is calculated by multiplying the maximum number of vessel calls in a week by the maximum cargo passenger units transferred per call, analyzing the results, and then dividing by seasonal picking factor. Seasonal picking is a ratio of peak to mean month of vessel throughput. For cargo terminals, the maximum number of calls in a week is based on bird utilization, crane productivity, crane assignment, and unproductive time. Bird utilization is limited by the need to allocate bird length in increments sufficient to accommodate viable vessel lengths, and by the need to assume that a bird space is available when a vessel calls, even if its arrival time is somewhat random. Given these constraints, the full gross capacity of a bird is never used. For instance, if a bird is 100% full and a vessel leaves, a vessel of exactly the same length would need to be standing by to take that space in order to sustain 100% utilization. 
Bird utilization is expressed as a net call duration demand multiplied by the gross bird length demand as bird foot hours or, met or meter hours. Gross bird length demand consists of the vessel overall length and the necessary gap between vessels to accommodate mooring lines. The mooring gap is applied evenly to either end of the vessel length. Net call duration demand consists of time to moor the vessel, time to unload and unload the vessel, time to unmoor the vessel and free the bird. The sum of these values is converted to gross call duration demand by dividing the allowable bird utilization. The gap between net and gross call duration is applied evenly to either end of the net duration. Exhibit C2 depicts these relationships between net and gross bird occupancy in space and time. With this approach, each vessel takes up an appropriate portion of the total space-time capacity of the bird. A bird model should allow the modeler to consider a mix of vessel classes, each with its own potential impact on demand and capacity. For each vessel class, the model should calculate gross occupancy demand in terms of bird length and call duration. The number of vessels of each class that the bird can accommodate should be calculated based on total bird length and the gross bird length occupancy of the class. As such, the number of birds in the available bird length is a function of classes of vessels that call at the bird. A sample output of bird occupancy demand is shown in Exhibit C3. Storage Constrained Capacity Exhibit C4 shows the general equation used to establish yard constrained capacity of a terminal. Storage capacity for each movement is calculated by multiplying the static storage of the specific yard area with the mean dwell days, analyzing the results to determine storage terms per year, and then dividing the seasonal and tactical picking. The capacity of the storage yard is the sum of the capacity of all flows passing through the storage yard per year. Static storage is based on maximum physical stacking area and stacking height, multiplied by storage utilization factors that depend on storage mode for each movement. While the model can estimate the gate and equipment requirements, these components are usually not considered constraining elements. For example, gate operating hours can be extended or lanes can be reconfigured and additional equipment can be purchased in response to increased demand. The peak gate lane demand at each station is calculated from the mean gate flow for each transaction type, augmented by seasonal and tactical picking factors, and divided by the maximum practical lane velocity. Similarly, the peak equipment demand is calculated from the mean bird and storage flow for each cargo type, augmented by the picking factors and divided by the maximum practical equipment productivities and utilization. Equipment quantities, quay cranes, storage yard cranes, chassis, yards, trucks, etc. can be estimated for each capacity level. While certain capacity factors can be controlled by a port, such as terminal configuration and layout, equipment deployed, and capital resources invested, capacity is also strongly influenced by external factors such as trade volumes, shipping patterns, throughput mixes, dwell times, the size and type of ships, rail, highway access, union work rules, custom regulations, and security. As these factors evolve over the life of the facility, the planning effort should be able to take into account different capacity scenarios. This is particularly important since the facility capacity can increase or decrease at any point in time without any changes to line use or infrastructure as a result of different external influences. Exhibit C6 shows an example of how varying factors can change throughput capacity based on future container ship deployment patterns. As the planning effort advances to subsequent phases of the project, the scenarios can be blended to reflect intermediate states in a phase development. The capacity analysis will identify the probability, magnitude, and timing of potential shortfalls in port capacity by comparing the existing practical capacities calculated by the model to forecasted projections.
The comparison will provide a guide of future needs for the port. Appendix D. Forecasting trade demand example. Multiple approaches to forecasting trade demand are available. In order of complexity, these generally include regression and trend line analysis. A simple, common, and generally useful technique for short-term projections and easily prepared by port staff. U.S. Economic Indicator Driven Forecast Based on changes in key U.S. economic indicators, may be reasonably well suited for general cargo, particularly containerized consumer goods, but are less well suited for commodities where trade volumes are less dependent on U.S. economic forces and have some important limitations. Macroeconomic Forecast Address changes in global production and consumption by country and commodity and are generally purchased from third-party economic modeling firms. They provide excellent detail, but typically do not address port infrastructure or competitiveness issues. Supply Chain Adjusted Macroeconomic Forecast Provide benefits of macroeconomic forecasts, but additionally consider factors such as vessel sizes and carrier services, port infrastructure constraints, inland truck and rail connections and cost, and other competitiveness factors. This approach provides the best possible forecast, but can be complex and costly. U.S. economic-driven forecasts used properly may provide useful information and can be developed relatively easy and inexpensively. They can meet near-term forecasting needs, bridging gaps between major forecasting efforts, or suggesting whether more intensive forecasting efforts are warranted. However, there are some important considerations and limitations to this approach. The most commonly cited U.S. economic indicator for poor forecasts is the Gross Domestic Product GDP. It has been postulated by many in the past that increases in the U.S. container volumes can reasonably be viewed as a multiple of GDP growth. As shown in Exhibit D1, container trade volumes grew more rapidly than real GDP from 1990 through 2006, and this growth different accelerated from 2001 through 2006. Container trade volumes grew at nearly twice the rate of real GDP from 1992 to, through 2001 and 2.8 times real GDP growth in 2002 to 2006. This postulated relationship offers an appealing proposition, reducing the container trade volume forecasting process to simply taking real GDP forecasts available from a number of sources and applying an appropriate multiplier to produce a container volume forecast. Unfortunately, this simple approach has two fundamental shortcomings. First, the history of the past 10 years shows that the previously suggested relationship is not valid or has expired. Comparing the pre-recession container volume levels of 2006 to the volumes of the years during and since the Great Recession shows that volumes have not increased as a positive, at a positive multiple of GDP. This suggests that a new theory of causal relationships between container volumes and real GDP is required. The second shortcoming of the postulated container trade GDP multiplier is that there has been no causal relationship offered to explain it. While there are certainly fundamental causal relationships between container volumes and real GDP, they are not with the GDP as a single aggregate indicator. In particular, container trade volumes are closely related with and directly related to one of the major components of GDP, U.S. real import value. Container trade is heavily unbalanced, with imports significantly exceeding exports. Imports were 2.8 exports in terms of 2014 value and 1.4 times export in weights. The strong correlation between container trade volumes and U.S. real import value is a subtraction in the GDP computation, representing the supply of goods and services sources from outside the U.S. that are used by the demand components of the GDP including personal consumption, investment, government and exports. 
Therefore, attempting to positively correlate container trade volumes to the total of real GDP when volumes are so closely and logically tied to a large negative value in GDP suggests that the simple relationship between container volumes and real GDP requires a better formulation. One simple solution would be to use forecasts of real imports as a way to project in container trade. Unfortunately, this simple solution also has a fundamental limitation. Total real import value includes very large portions of unrelated container trade despite the apparent relationships. These unrelated GDP components include imports of services 22% of import value in 2014, imports of many goods that are carried in vessels but not in containers such as US imports of oil and other bulk goods 18% of imported goods value. High value imports of goods by air, 23% of imported goods value. Very large volumes of imported goods by other than vessels or air, largely overland from major trading partners, Canada and Mexico, 27% of imported goods value in 2014. After the above exclusions, containerized imports represented about 31% of total imported goods value in 2014 and about 25% of total import value. For U.S. container volume forecast to be based on projections of U.S. real GDP, container volume should be related to demand components of GDP rather than GDP as a whole or imports. This makes sense as many imports of goods can be directly related to goods consumed, used in physical investments or used in US-based production.